Hello, Professor Rosen, Peter, and classmates. I'm Thomas Lerner, and we are the fire team. I'm here today to tell you about the climber cables. Today's topics include introduction and background, the design process we went through, system and subsystem design descriptions, analyses, and our conclusion. First off, meet Andy Larner, my brother. Andy was a firefighter with Cal Fire for four years and just got hired to San Diego City Fire Department last fall. During his academy, one of his classmates fell off an aerial ladder and broke both of his legs. But not everyone is so lucky. Meet Kelly Wong. Kelly is a two-year veteran of LA Fire Department that fell off an aerial ladder on June 3rd, 2017, while participating in a training exercise downtown. Firefighter Wong was immediately rushed to the hospital by his fellow firefighters and paramedics who were on scene. Despite the heroic efforts by the doctors and nurses at the local trauma center, firefighter Wong succumbed to his injuries on the morning of June 5th. He is survived by his wife and infant son. It was shocking to my brother why there wasn't already a system in place on aerial ladder trucks to protect firefighters against falls. He came to me, said that I should design it. It was perfect because that's when this class was starting in the winter. So it gave me an idea. As I did more research into uh, aerial ladder protections, which you can see on screen, it became more and more apparent that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. The percentage of injuries from aerial ladder falls and their related costs to cities, departments, and families is staggeringly high and could definitely benefit from the impl implementation of a safety system. The main problem was definitely as firefighters climb the aerial ladder on the truck, they are susceptible to injury or death from falling off. At this time, there is no way for firefighters to secure themselves to the ladder during their ascent. The cause of these accidents is often due to the steep incline of the ladder, slips, carrying too much weight, or the speed at which the firefighter is trying to climb. After de determining our problem that the team would be addressing and the likely causes of it, we were able to find our objectives and design requirements. The objective of our design is to stop a firefighter from falling to their death. The requirements of our system to accomplish this objective is to be safe, because if it's not safe, then what's the point? Reliable, because we need the firefighters and their departments to feel they can depend on our product. Uh, and it allows the firefighter to climb normally, because if it encumbers the firefighter, they might opt to not use it to be able to climb faster or carry more equipment except this is exactly when they should be using it, as this is when a fall is more likely. And lastly, it needs to be economical because we cannot actually protect the lives of firefighters if departments don't buy them. In our project, the performance specification method was a method that we use in order to better identify what we needed our product to do. Um, so generally, the performance specification method starts at the highest level, very general, um, and then gets more and more focused as you further develop the uh, model. So firstly, um, it's very specific to fire ladders. Our product only works um, when mounted to the underside of a fire ladder on top of a truck. And they can only use you on fire engines due to the fact that they, are, they need power and they're quite large and need to be able to be mobile. And the only possible platform for this for our solution is a fire truck. Um, performance attributes, the things we decided were the most important were the ability to arrest the fall, ability to be reused, and ability to be learned quickly. So able to arrest a fall, we estimated um, around, has to be able to withstand at least 500 pounds, and we ended up using a factor of 10 safety minimum, um, as is the industry standard. We estimated around 500 pounds in case there's a firefighter carrying gear or carrying another person with them. We want them, if they fall, to be able to be caught. Um, it also needed a short length to stop the swing. So our biggest concern was even if they fall off the ladder, if the rope is too long and they swing, they could hit the burning building, they could hit the ladder, get knocked unconscious, things like that. So we really needed the product to stop them as soon as possible and get, keep them from getting momentum and keep them from getting hurt. And the second thing we focused on was the ability to be reused. Um, it needs to be attached to the bottom of the ladder. It needs to be able to be reused constantly. Whatever the firefighters need, it needs to be there. It needs to be ready. It needs to be easy to access. And it doesn't need, needs to not need much preparation. Basically, just needs to be able to be turned on and then be used. Um, it needs to be attachable, so multiple firefighters can use it in quick succession. It can be brought up and down. It needs to be made of rugged material, right? Steel, Kevlar, 
Um, we ended up using a fire resistant rope and then all the other parts are mostly made out of steel in order to be very durable and reusable. Last thing is needs to be able to be learned quickly. Um, Firefighter is a very stressful job. It needs to be a very simple product. Um, it needs to be able to be attached wherever they need it or disattached. And they need to be able to just use it quickly without even thinking about it. Clip on, go up, unclip or clip on, go down, unclip. It needs to not hinder their performance in any way and it needs to provide, still provide the safety. It needs to also have a low cost of training and time. Um, firefighters spend a lot of time training and we don't want this product to, have to add a lot to their training schedule. Mistakes and catastrophes generally lead to regulatory action and product innovations and in safety. For example, regular activities like driving and occupations like mining and construction have benefited from novel technologies and legislative safety precautions. So why do we deprive some of our nation's heroes of the safety and peace of mind they deserve? It warrants being said, not many job descriptions demand ascending an eight story tall ladder extending towards a burning building. Unfortunately, reports indicate that 11% of all firefighter injuries are still due to falling. And if we dig deeper, more specific research reveals that in one year, LA County Fire Department alone experienced 29 new insurance claims related to falls, specifically from aerial ladders. That's where the fire team comes in. We developed the Climber Cables, an aerial ladder safety system. We differentiate ourselves easily because we are filling a safety void. And eventually, the safety system we developed will become mandatory. So before diving into parts and functions, let's take a brief look at the financials. Initially, the parts you're about to see will run us $8,300 per unit. And it should be noted that these costs will come down substantially over time as we establish relationships with our suppliers and are able to scale towards ordering parts in bulk. Considering the costs as they are today, we will sell our product at $25,000 per unit. And to diversify our revenue stream, following industry practices, we will charge an installation fee for each unit, as well as a recurring maintenance subscription. It's also important to contextualize the prices, the price with buyers. So let's take a look into how departments will pay for this. To do this, we'll analyze our most likely beachhead market, New York County, New York. This county accounts for 245 stations with 145 aerial ladder trucks. This county represents a total annual budget of 2.03 billion US dollars, which eclipses the cost of outfitting each of their aerial ladder trucks. So now let's jump into our product. So now we'll go through some of our earlier designs. Our earliest design was a carabiner that was tethered to the firefighter and passed through a series of ratcheting metal gates on the ladder. It provided many problems that we couldn't solve. Most importantly, how to protect the firefighter from falling when they are going down the ladder. The second iteration of our plan was completely different. It involved a cable coming out of a black box at the bottom of the ladder, running up the side through a pulley and back down to the black box. The firefighter would be attached via a tether to the cable. Our final design is not too unlike our second iteration. The black box was explicated more into a mirrored set of motors, gearboxes, and in brakes with a torque sensor down near the base of the ladder to provide a or that controlled them when they were uh, controlled the cable when it moved. The cable became a flame resistant, extremely strong rope, and the pulley at the top became two pulleys that would allow the cable to run up one side across and then back down the other. This would actually provide good angle of attacks to the spool of rope. Along, the, along with the torque sensor um, that is making sure the tether is following the firefighter. There are external controls on the fire truck that allow a ground-based firefighter to operate the system when nobody is attached. This is very useful in a number of situations. And lastly, the whole system is powered through the generator in the truck. Now that we've had an overview of the system by me, we will talk about each of the subsystems and analyses. The motor assembly will explain by Connor, the rope design will be explained by Brett. The pulley design will be explained by Gabe. The controls will be explained by Will. The electronics will be explained by Brett. The finite element analysis will be explained by Lindsay. And motion analysis will be explained by Nick. 
Hello, my name is Connor and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the motor and brake subsystem of our project. Um, first, I'll go over some of the general mechanics of how the system works. Uh, basically, the goal is to take energy from the truck and use the motors to convert it into translational energy for the rope that the firefighter will be attached to while he is climbing up and down the ladder. Um, in order to create this transfer of energy, um, there's several components required. Um, we need to use a motor, a brake, a gearbox, a torque sensor, a coupler, and a spool. And each of these components is vital to the functionality of the system. And uh, without them, uh, the motors would not be able to make the spools move how they need to. Each component has uh, two of them. Um, there's two mirrored systems underneath the ladder uh, that mirror with the spools on either side with the wings. Um, this is to ensure that the rope is able to always remain in control. Uh, it works well while the person is climbing up and down to have these motors with separate controllers communicate with one another to determine what the climber is doing and what the motor should do. Uh, this is also helpful when the ladder is expanding and contracting. Um, having both motors and spools able to be controlled allows this operation to go smoothly. Um, this was one of the bigger concerns um, when dealing with the, the controls. So having multiple ways to make sure it goes smoothly is very important. Um, now I'll talk about the motor a little bit. Uh, we initially decided to use a 25 horsepower motor uh, to meet speed and torque requirements that we were originally planning on doing. This included the ability to hoist the hoist or lower the firefighter if they were to fall. Um, after further design, we realized that our 10 kilowatt generator could not handle this much load. So we needed to come up with a workaround. Um, so we decided to remove the hoisting capabilities um, and maintain the, the speed capabilities because this is more important for the functionality of the device. And we decided to rely solely on the brake to stop any falling or um, issues that arise. Um, in this situation, you would need to go and manually retrieve the firefighter in the case of an accident. But this is preferable to trying to retrieve them using the device and having some sort of malfunction where they get hurt even further um, because of trying to rescue them. So we wanted to eliminate any kind of risk in that sense. Um, we decided to implement a one and a half horsepower AC motor for McMaster car. Uh, this provides us enough power to move the ropes and hold tension. Uh, this is all that we really need the motor for uh, if the brake's able to back up a fall. Um, yeah, uh, when there's too much back torque uh, due to a fall, the brake will take over and uh, do what it needs. Uh, this motor is much easier to work with and integrate than the original motor we were planning on using. Uh, many of the other components in the system were designed with the original motor in mind. Uh, we decided to keep these in place because they are all very powerful and will add, um, add more safety to the overall system. Uh, when talking about the brake, this is probably the most important safety feature to the user. So we wanted to make sure that the brake was reliable and had a large factor of safety. Um, the brake has a braking force of about 465 foot pounds and this gave us a factor of safety of about 23 uh, which is over the desired marks that we were trying to reach. This is important that the brake reach it, beats this factor of safety because this is what is stopping the firefighter from falling. Um, when power is removed from the system, um, the brake stops working. This lends itself very well to our emergency stop feature. And um, this lends itself very well to our emergency stop feature. And it lends itself well to the natural controls of the system. The system moves based on reactions from the torque sensor. And if the torque sensor notices any torque out of the ordinary, it will immediately shut off the brake, um, halting the person's fall. Uh, this is the fundamental purpose and this is what our system does best. Um, the next component is the gearbox. So the brake is in line with the motor and the gearbox. So it, it all feeds into that input on the left side of the upper right hand image and it comes out um, there's a 90 degree turn hole on the other side. Um, we ended up using a five to one gear ratio to achieve 345 RPM uh, from our motor that has about 1700, um, a little over 1700 RPM. Uh, this is more than enough speed to get the firefighter 
uh, up and down the ladder. We used, uh, we thought of using a two-phase transmission uh, late in the implementation in order to alleviate the issue with the hoisting, but at this point we had already decided that the hoisting capability was unnecessary to the functionality and a two-phase transmission would cause, um, could, could be a source of more um, issues and error that we didn't want to incorporate into the system. Another iteration of the gearbox that we considered was using a worm gearbox to avoid back driving. Uh, this would have been a very good idea if we were able to find reliable worm gearboxes that were able to work with the torques that were involved with the back drive. Um, in theory, these gearboxes would still be able to resist the back drive force, but without any specific specifications listed, um, we were hesitant to implement these without doing further research. So we decided to end up uh, to use a helical bevel gear um, because it was rated to work with the original motor and it will not buckle under the high back force and it will transmit the energy to the brake uh, for it to be halted. Um, the torque sensor is also a very important part of the device. Uh, this is in, um, in shaft, it comes out of the gearbox and will feed into the spool system. Um, the sensor uh, has a very wide range of readable values from half a newton meter to uh, 1,000 newton meters. Uh, this is perfect for reading the small torque changes that will be occurring as the firefighter is climbing up and down the ladder. And it's also capable of realizing when there's a force that wouldn't be expected in standard operation and immediately shutting down the system. Um, this also provides our means of control. So the torque sensor will feed into the controller and a simple PID action will be done to ensure that the rope is able to keep up with the firefighter as they are climbing. Uh, we did not delve into the details of this controller since none of us had any particular interest in the controls and it could serve as a black box for our intents and purposes, uh, at least during the initial design phases. Um, so now we have the spool system. Uh, this system we designed ourselves so that we could run analysis. Uh, the spool is gonna be receiving the brunt of the force from the fall and we wanted to make sure that we could account for all different um, types of forces that it could interact with. And we thought this would be easier if we designed it ourselves so we had a solid CAD with the capability of running a full FEA test on it. Um, the spool system attaches to the torque sensor using a coupler and is supported by ball bearings on either side to ensure that the spool is held in place and is able to rotate freely. The rope is attached to the spool using a C-ring on the spool. Um, there will be a knot type thing at the end of the rope that will make, make sure that it doesn't pass through. However, this shouldn't be a problem because in all use cases of our system, the rope will be wrapped uh, several times around the spool already. So there should be very little force actually imposed on the C-ring. We also decided to use a spool radius of three inches um, the decision for this involves optimizing speed and torque. Um, we wanted our thing to be able to run faster. Uh, so a bigger uh, radius of the spool would be ideal. However, with a bigger radius comes more uh, torque due to a fall. So three inches was the best solution to ensure our optimal functionality. Um, so here's the frame. This is where all of the components are mounted to. Uh, there's three main components of the frame. There's the motor mount, um, the winged frame, and the connection to the truck. Uh, these are shown on the bottom two images. The motor mount um, is shown by the arrow is a small separate feature where both the motors are held. This is to try to keep them extra stable and isolate them from the system. Um, the winged frame is much larger and it juts out to the sides. Uh, this is what holds the motor mount as well as the rest of the components. Um, it's important to have good functionality uh, in this component, it needs to be strong. And we ran a thorough analysis on this component to make sure that it would not buckle under pressure. And then on the bottom right image, you can see the connection to the truck. You can see three horizontal lines. Um, these will align with the rungs of the ladder and clamps will be placed over them that fully encompass the rung of the ladder to better distribute the force um, from the system. 
uh, we decided that the bottom of the ladder was the best place to put the system so that it could interact easily with the spools at the top of the ladder and so that it wouldn't interfere with anything else. Uh, we thought about putting it on the sides of the ladder and on the bottom of the truck, but the sides of the ladder are not designed to hold any kind of weight. And when it's connected to the truck, that there are issues with the cables ability to run parallel with the ladder uh, without any external um, complex systems to make that possible. So the bottom of the truck was the best option. And sort of goes more into here, um, more into the integration here. As you can see on the picture of the right, um, the frame is mounted to the bottom of the truck. You can see the hydraulic hoist on the left. Uh, we ran a motion analysis, moving the ladder to its maximum height, and there was no interference between these components and our system. Uh, this is very important because any kind of interference with the truck would cause uh, like our system to completely lose its value. So it was very important to make sure that we were able to fit it in this compact space um, and have its functionality. Uh, the power for this comes from the truck, as you can see on that bottom right picture. This is a black box demonstrating the power from the truck. It feeds into a high power control box shown on the end of the wing, and then it feeds into the rest of the components of the system. Um, there is a covering of the system, as you can see in this upper right hand picture, uh, that is not depicted here so that we can show where the wires connect. But in theory, these wires would be lined along the inside of this casing so everything is fully enclosed. Um, the controls for this are fed through the truck through that bottom right box um, and there will be a separate control panel on the side of the truck where the user can operate the system. Thank you. Hey guys, so for my part of the design process I was tasked with making the rope and electronic systems for our design. So for the rope the main problem we ran into was that the design spec sheet that we found did not have the adequate material like uh, design properties that we needed such as the elastic modulus so to overcome that i made a uh, a 3d model of the rope in cad simplified of course that will hopefully be an adequate representation that we can find the young's modulus from so in order to find that i pasted the uh, two steel caps on the end to get a better even distribution of the weight across the whole rope and then after that I applied a one Newton force and measured the displacement in cab. And from that, we were able to find the stress and strain and calculate the Young's modulus of the rope, given the materials that we have. The main problem that we ran into was that although the tension, like uh, yield strength of the rope was high enough, we weren't sure if um, in the worst case scenario of an entirely horizontal ladder with uh, that's fully outstretched, if the firefighter would impact the ground and um, given the calculation is done by me and Nick, we were able to find that this was a sufficient um, K value of the rope to stop the firefighter from hitting the ground. So for the pulleys, we had a number of design challenges. Um, mainly the biggest things we focused on were they need to be not too cumbersome and they needed to be um, easy to access for the firefighter when they're on the top um, so that they can unclip from the rope without kind of stretching over the side of the um, box. We went through several design iterations on what to put at the top of the ladder. Um, initially, we thought we'd put some electronics, we put in secondary winch, um, and then we went to putting an auto belay system, as uh, Tommy discussed. Then we eventually settled on using pulleys. Um, we originally had one, and then due to the constraints of the ladder and concerns about the rope being caught on the ladder while the firefighter was ascending, we put a second pulley. The rope goes up, across, and back down, and stairs stays completely clear of the ladder due to the mounting of the system on the bottom and the points of connection on the top. Both the pulleys are connected directly to the mounting um, of the ladder at the top of the box. Uh, they're all attached to U-bolts, which are threaded through the box itself through um, holes, and then they're attached on the backside with a steel plate. The U-bolt specs, they're both from a master car. The U-bolts themselves have a weight bearing capacity of 2,000 pounds and are each made of galvanized steel. Um, of varying thicknesses. It's very easy to change the thickness of the U-bolt if necessary. You just drill a bigger hole um, and we're not and then increase the weight bearing capacity. We're not very concerned with having these um, as our point of failure. Um, the pulleys, they're single groove weight bearing pulleys, um, heavy duty made for vertical lifting, which is exactly what we were looking for. They each have a 13,000 pound weight bearing capacity and they're each made out of stainless steel. 
Um, we wanted to make sure that the pulley at the top was not our point of failure for the system and that if anything would happen, it would be with the electronics at the bottom. That way, even if for some reason it breaks down, it's not going to cause the firefighter to fall off of the ladder. Let us now consider control systems. Observable in the technologies we see and use every day, the relevance of user interfaces is tremendous. Fluid and perhaps even beautiful interfaces separate inventions from products and often successful products from the unsuccessful ones. Consider how Apple began carving out a market share for itself by offering sleek new computers that took the guesswork and crude edges out of the picture. Nowadays, there are industrial and military guidelines and suggestions available for designers to use when designing controls. So let's look at the primary control panel of the system. The key function of the system is the climber tracking of the rope, but it's also important that operators can manually control the rope for setup, maintenance, etc. Additionally, as life-saving equipment, the system must protect against use by unauthorized individuals. Thus, designed from left to right with majority right-handedness in mind, the first input is for authorization. This manifests in a three-position key switch with each position left up and right, separated by 90 degrees. At the left position, the system is inactive. In the up position, the system is authorized, which is indicated by a light switching from red to green. Pressing the on button in this position enables climber tracking. However, turning the key to the right position switches the mode to manual rope operation. Pressing the on button in this position enables the up-down rocker switch found to the right of the on-off switch. The three different lights you see adjacent to the rocker switch indicate whether it is directing the cable to move up, down, or remain stationary. Finally, in accordance with accepted industry and military suggestions, an emergency stop button is located in the upper right-hand corner, easily reached but out of the way to avoid accidental pressing. In order to add adaptability and mobility to the controls interface, a secondary corded remote control is connected. This simplified user interface is subject to the authorization found on the main control panel. It is capable of manually adjusting the rope position, performing the job of the rocker switch on the main panel. More importantly, this device includes an emergency stop button. This provides the added benefit of allowing an operator to control the situation from a better view away from the truck. So for the electronics of the system, we decided that an Arduino Uno would be sufficient as not many digital outputs and analog inputs are needed to run the device. So the, um, the entire device is ran on this Arduino Uno and it takes inputs from the buttons, which is represented of the, by the like control panel of the device. And it, the main um, safety feature of the device is that there's a power relay system built into the re into the Arduino, such that if the um, if the Arduino sends an output voltage, it can shut off power to the motor, and this is just so that the motor doesn't behave unexpectedly when the emergency stop is pressed, and we have more control over the actuation of the motor. Okay, this is the uh, simplified circuit design for our our uh, design. The um, the relay is represented on the top right by the output to the motor and the power generation from the alternator is represented by the circular um, AC voltage. And uh, for, through our calculations, we were able to find that 18, 14, and 12 gauge wires were sufficient to carry all the power we would need. Components of the high voltage power uh, required an optocoupler, which is basically a uh, a uh, way to isolate two electrical signals so that they don't pass too much voltage through each other. And this is just to add more redundancy to the, um, as well as isolate both of the signals. So the relay system is essentially just a, a switch activated by current passing through the coil. And this will switch, the, switch it to ground when the Arduino passes a high current, relatively high current through it. This is just to add more control so we don't have unwanted behavior.
Finally, to convert the, um, the power from the motor to Arduino power, you use a buck converter to convert it to 110 to 9 volt AC. And then finally use a rectifier to convert that to DC power. For my portion of the project today, we're going to be talking about finite element analysis. Finite element analysis is a form of static analysis in which the component's real 3D geometry is discretized into smaller elements. And these calculations are governed by the quadratic equation, which is a high enough order polynomial that the calculations end up being very accurate for the different analysis portions that we need. Uh, the, discretize, the discretization we use is uh, solid tetrahedral masses, which are adjacent to each other and they form a mesh. And each individual solid tetrahedral mass is calculated for its stresses, strains, and other various properties as you need for your analysis. With respect to our mechanical system, uh, we will be looking at each individual element of the mechanical system and analyze them under the static human load. And this is going to be a load that's as if the person were, had fallen and were to be suspended stationarily by the system. And these loads are translated to the system in various ways and are going to be modeled as forces and torques, depending on the different component that we're looking at. And all finite element analysis was completed on SOLIDWORKS simulation for the purpose of this project. The first component we're going to be looking at today is frame static analysis. The frame serves as the mounting interface between the fire truck ladder and the mechanical components, and it's made of alloy steel. Now, despite the fact that the safety system spans the entire length of the ladder, from the perspective of the frame, the only components necessary for analysis are going to be the spool and the shaft, the motor, the brake, the gearbox, and the human. And these, as you can see in the chart on the right, apply different forces to the frame, and so we will be modeling those for our analysis. The frame is analyzed in three different orientations. It's going to be the vertical and horizontal orientation, which is going to be the maximum that the ladder is going to be at, and also a 45 degree orientation, which is somewhere right in the middle. Um, the fixed restraint is going to be on the entire bottom plane of the frame, and that's going to be the only restraint that is used for the analysis. And that's going to serve as a model for if the frame is welded onto the ladder. The force locations are shown in this figure. Uh, the motor mount is in box A on the top of the frame. The forces from the spool and the shaft, as well as the human falling, are going to be in boxes B and D. And the brake and the gearbox is going to be in centrally located in box C. In the vertical orientation, the motor mount force, the spool, and the brake and the gearbox, the, mat, the weight due to those is going to be along the plane in the Z direction, which is going to be downward. And then the human falling is going to be upward along the plane of the frame as well. However, it's going to be in the direction of the ladder, so upward, it'll be in the opposite direction. Now, the maximum stress that the frame will feel due to these different forces is going to be 8.816 times 10 to the sixth which is well above the yield strength of alloy steel. And so the factor of safety is going to be 68.88. And the maximum displacement is 0 0.05 millimeters, which is very small and doesn't need to be a point of concern for the frame. In the horizontal orientation, uh, the motor mount, the spool, and the gear and the brake box are all normal to the, the weight of those is normal to the face of the frame. And it's going to be in the Y direction. Now, the human falling is still going to be in the direction of the ladder, which is still dedicated as the negative Z direction. And now in this orientation, the maximum stress that is felt by the frame is going to be 3.185 times 10 to the seventh. And it's also felt at the junction of the wings and the main body of the frame, as it was in the vertical orientation. This factor of safety is much lower. However, it's still well within our range. It's going to be 19.48, which is well above the factor of safety needed of 10. And the maximum displacement in this orientation is 0.25 millimeters, which is still very small compared to the size of the actual frame. In the 45 degree orientation, a little bit of um, vector math was used in order to create the 45 degree force on the frame itself. And so we used two vectors of equal magnitude perpendicular to one another to create that 45 degree orientation. And so now the motor mount, the spool portion, and the gear and the brake box are all at a 45 degree angle downward, and the human falling is going to be at a 45 degree angle upward. Uh, the maximum stress felt at this orientation is 2.998 times 10 to the seventh, which is only marginally, uh, marginally lower than the force felt in the horizontal orientation. This factor of safety is still much higher than the needed 10, it is 20.69, and the displacement is still much smaller than the size of the frame, so we can deem that to be negligible. 
For the spool static analysis, the spool serves as an interface between the rope and the mechanical system. As you can see, there's a little C ring, as we talked about earlier, and that's where the rope is going to be attached to the spool itself. Now, this is made of alloy steel as well, and it's going to be bolted to the shaft, which is a through shaft with five holes, which are modeled, as you can see in the picture on the right, and those are modeled as uh, five roller slider restraints when, with respect to analysis. Now, the only force that's going to be used for the spool analysis is going to be a 980 Newton force upward on the C-ring, which is the modeling as a sustained tension from the rope. And this force is modeled as the human body falling. And so that is going to be the only, um, that's going to be the only force in this. And then the restraints, its only restraints are going to be the five roller slider restraints that serve as the bolt holes. Now the results for this, the maximum stress is felt at the junction of the C-ring and the spool, and the maximum stress is 1.718 times 10 to the seven, well above the yield strength, or well below the yield strength, I'm sorry. And the factor of safety is 36.11. And the displacement is 0.276 millimeters, um, and it's going to be found on the C-ring itself. However, that is small enough that we don't need to worry about it. So um, there should not be, even with repeated use, there will not be a disformations from the uh, forces. Now the shaft static analysis is a through shaft. The shaft static analysis is a through shaft that connects the spool to the motor and it is made of alloy steel as well as the other two components we previously talked about and it is bolted to the spool with the five uh, through hole bolts as uh, was modeled in the spool as well. And those are also modeled as rolling sliding restraints with respect to finite element analysis. Um, there are also two other restraints that are going to be used for this analysis because the through shaft is going to be held by ball bearings on either each respective end. One end is going to be modeled as a rolling sliding restraint and the other end is going to be modeled as completely fixed. Now there's going to be two different um, forces applied to this. There's going to be one 980 Newton force upward, which is translated from the shaft, from the spool to the shaft. And so it's only on the bottom half of the shaft. And then in the center section as well, it's not where the restraints are on either end. And then there's going to be a 74.676 Newton meter torque on each bolt hole, which is translated from the spool having a 980 Newton force on it as well, but also, um, and then causes a torque because there's a radius of the spool. And so the radius of the spool, as you can see in the math on the bottom of the slide, um, that's where the 74.676 Newton meter torque is uh, coming from. And now the shaft results, the maximum stress that we feel we find on the shaft is going to be 3.49 times 10 to the seven. And this factor of safety is going to be 17.76, which is the lowest factor of safety that we found across the entire static mechanical system. Um, however, it's still well above 10. And so because this is the lowest factor of safety that we found, the factor of safety for the entire mechanical system, the entire mecha static mechanical system is going to be 17.76. Now the displacement of this is 0 0.071 millimeters and it's going to be um, a slight jog in the shaft due to the different fixtures on either end. However, there will not be significant deformations due to this um, over time. And so it is a, a negligible thing to worry about. In this static analysis, the goal was to assure that the rope that we design will stretch only so much that in a worst case scenario, the firefighter will not hit the ground. In this case, the worst case scenario was defined as the ladder being completely horizontal and also at its full length. The ropes were modeled as springs. Instead of finding the actual spring constant of the rope, I calculated what I call a Ki value. This means that the K value of the rope is this Ki divided by the length of the rope. As such, the longer the rope, the more stretch it has. This analysis also used the property that the drop distance is twice that of the hanging distance. Shown on screen is the model of the system used and the free body diagram of the firefighter. I did the force balance and inputted the subsequent equation to MATLAB to find this graph. It shows that the maximum Ki value is 2.2 times 10 to the power of 6 newtons. The design of the rope, as seen previously in this presentation by Brett, was done accordingly. 
The motion analysis for this design was done on SOLIDWORKS via the motion analysis tab on the bottom row. The first analysis done was the animation of a fireman climbing the ladder while attached to the system. Multiple things had to be simplified for this analysis. First, the parallel system that is on the other side of the ladder was omitted as it was not relevant for this animation, nor would it interfere with the climb. Additionally, due to limitations of computational power, the rope system was modeled as a static rope reaching from the spool to the pulley. As such, the movement of the system was simulated by having the rope attached to the firefighter along the static rope. The, this preserves the motion that the rope attached to the firefighter would have. Additionally, this rope was modeled as three equal length segments. The final simplification was to have the firefighter attached at only a single point on his back. This analysis shows the firefighter climbing from the bottom of the ladder to the top. It serves to prove that the rope from the system to the firefighter is long enough to avoid interfering with the firefighter's climb while being pretty much as short as possible. It also serves as a visualization of how the system works. And here it is. The other motion analysis for this design was the drop test. The same assembly was used as the previous motion analysis, so it lacks the second part of the system and has a simplified version of the ropes. However, this one was done with basic motion analysis instead of just an animation. At first, the animation was going to include um, possible collisions between the firefighter and the ladder during the fall. However, when I was using SOLIDWORKS motion add-on to accomplish this, the available computers I used were unable to handle the computations and produced broken analysis. For example, the mates in the system would break whenever objects collided. This also prevented the creation of the motion plots from this analysis. Another limitation of this was that modeling of the rope as three segments led to inaccurate motion after the fall. This caused the firefighter to bounce and spin on the rope, which would not be the case with a more realistic analysis. However, the results with basic motion and gravity was an animation that shows the firefighter dropping from the left side of the ladder and being caught by the rope before they would have hit the ground. This proves that, the climbing, or that climbing with the system attached can prevent falls from being fatal. Now we've reached our discussion. We've showed you through this presentation how we've set and met the design requirements of the climber cables. The first design requirement was safety. The factor of safety of our system never fell below 17.76, which is 76% higher than our goal of a factor of safety of 10. The next was reliability. The climber cables were tested in a number of different scenarios and at different angles, and it performed admirably. The next was uninhibited climbing, and this was accomplished through the use of the torque sensor that allowed the firefighter to move uninhibited and uh, just as fast as they'd like, and for the external controls when there's nobody attached to the system. The economic goals were accomplished by designing a variable attachment method allowed for different trucks ladders and by making it priced at only $25,000 per unit which is a drop in the bucket compared to the cost of medical and legal fees in the event of a falling accident. Thank you for your time, and I hope you've enjoyed learning about our product, the Climber Cables.